Good morning and welcome to worship. There we go. Now I'm with it. I'm glad to see all of you here in the sanctuary with me and welcome to those who are worshiping with us at home online. We are glad that you are with us as well. This morning I have just a couple of announcements. If you have not yet completed the congregational survey for the mission study team, please go ahead and do that. You can find a link in your newsletter. Uh, there are copies out here and just make sure to get it in. We'll have them out for one more week, okay? So one more week to finish off your surveys. And thank you to everyone who has already done the survey. We have received over 60 responses so far. So thank you so much. That's great response. Also, today is Communion Sunday. So if you are here in the sanctuary, we have these cute little chalice cups. Um, they're different than what we've had before, but they are easier to open and I promise they taste better. And I know I have taste tested it, it does taste better. And if you are at home, please feel free to grab whatever it is that you have near at hand. God accepts all. So whether it's water, a cracker, juice, and a cookie, just grab something to use as the elements of bread and wine. Friends, would you please stand in body or in spirit as you are able and called and join me in the call to worship. Take off your shoes. We are standing on holy ground. Shake off the dust. We are ready to start afresh. Let us worship God and receive Christ's teachings that we may be renewed and strengthened to share God's love with the world. Come, let us worship God as we sing together hymn number 466 out of the Blue Presbyterian hymnal, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. light this candle as a sign and a symbol for each one of us that we are surrounded by the light and the love of Christ. That whether we worship here in the building or at home online, whether we are near or far, we are united in the light of Christ. And I invite us to pass the peace and if there are those who don't want to shake hands, a very simple way is to pass the peace in American Sign Language saying, peace be with you. Go and share a sign of peace with one another.
Our psalm this morning is Psalm 123. This is a song of ascents. You may be seated. This is a song of ascents. So this is an ancient hymn that the Israelites would have sung as they walked up the mountain to the temple. And this is all about asking and pleading for divine mercy. Psalm 123. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hands of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Amen. Friends, when we have to look at the relationships that we hope to have with one another and with God, we must admit how broken we are. But as we gather in the presence of God, we are promised forgiveness and healing if we confess our sins. Please join me as we pray to the one who never ceases to love us. Let us pray. You know how stubborn we can be, holy God. You call us to serve others, and we stay in the coolness of our own homes. You would send us to where the hopeless live, but we are reluctant to leave the comfort of our complacency. You would feed us on the peace and joy of your word, but we pull our chairs up to the tables of those who serve false promises. Forgive us, guiding God. Transform our defiance into discipleship and our rejection of others into the resurrection of welcoming all people as beloved siblings in Christ. Help us to love as faithfully as you have always loved us, and send us forth to take the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone we meet. Amen. We open our lips and confess our hearts. God hears our words and makes us new, sending us out to bring hope and joy to all the world. We hear the good news, we believe the good news, we will live out the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us sing now a song of forgiveness, halle, halle, hallelujah, and we'll sing it twice through. Halle, halle, halle. our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Hear now God's word. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? 
and they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deeds of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you, and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This is God's word for us today. Please pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our story today is all about how Jesus handles rejection. He's not going to This won't be the first time that Jesus is rejected. It won't be the last time that Jesus is rejected. Jesus is getting used to being rejected. But there's something especially meaningful and awful about this rejection because he has gone home to Nazareth. He has gone home to the people who watched him grow up from childhood. He has gone home to see those who raised him, his village, his family, his people. And they reject him. He goes to teach in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they are astounded at him. And this is not a good kind of astounded. It's more of like a shock and awe, who do you think you are kind of astounded. Who does this guy think he is? Doesn't he remember? We know everything that he did in childhood. We know what he was like as a teenager. And now he's coming back here after a couple years away and suddenly acts like he has the authority to talk to us? Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? And Jesus, I don't think, quite knows what to do. I think Jesus is also shocked by the reaction that he gets because the people are very pointed. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary? Notice they don't mention Joseph. And the scholars are kind of divided. There are, about, there are two main reasons why scholars say that Joseph isn't mentioned. One, because Joseph was probably already deceased, but the other is that they only mention Mary because they're pointing out Jesus' history. They're saying, we remember your birth. We remember how Mary said an angel of the Lord visited her and suddenly she was pregnant and we all know it was not Joseph's baby. And they're all saying that he's the son of Mary, he's illegitimate, and therefore his message is illegitimate, and there is nothing that can come from his mouth that they would listen to because they do not respect him or his mother or his family. Because they remember his history. Now, this is actually a natural phenomenon. This idea that we are suddenly, when we go back home, we are suddenly treated like we were when we were teenagers again. 
This is actually a psychological phenomenon. It's, it's known as regression, and it's this idea that we've grown up, we've gone away, but then when we come back home, a family member says something to us. And it triggers in us a response, a memory of what it was like when we were angsty teenagers and suddenly we're acting like we're 14 again and then our parents are treating us like we're 14 again and then everybody's upset. And this is actually a psychological phenomenon. It happens across the world. And so Jesus, well before modern psychology explains this to us, says, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. I get it. Prophets are not without honor. Prophets have honor except when they go home. Because in Jesus' world, honor is a limited resource. There isn't enough honor to go around. And Jesus and his family are already considered dishonorable. The son of Mary, that guy, the carpenter. What does he have to say to us? And Jesus recognizes that there is not enough honor in this town to spare him any. And he says, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. In their own house. And suddenly, we remember. Just a couple weeks ago, I read a passage where Jesus is in a house and his mother and his brothers and sisters come to pull him away because they think he's gone completely insane. And so Jesus is making reference to this now. Prophets are not without honor except in their own house. Not even his own family can recognize and respect him. Not yet, not now. We know that they will. We know that his brothers become very faithful disciples and apostles of the word. We know that his mother Mary is there at the cross with him when everyone else would have run away. His mother is there. We know that they are there, but that relationship hasn't changed yet. And so we have this dishonored prophet who goes home and his family treats him like he's crazy. They treat him like, Jesus, you know, we know what you were like when you were 15. Don't try to fool us now, acting all holy. You know, they, and he goes among his kin and they say, Jesus, we know. We know your whole history. We know that you can't have any honor because your whole birth was dishonorable. He goes to his village, his hometown, and they say, Jesus, we know you're nothing more than a carpenter. Go build something and leave the teaching to someone else. And Jesus is amazed at their unbelief. And this word amaze, it's almost kind of like he's also hurt by this unbelief. He's shocked by it. He can't quite comprehend it. And scripture tells us he could do no deeds of power there, except he did cure a few people. He laid some hands, cured some sick people. But there is a lack of faith in him, in his message, in what he is trying to teach. There is a lack of faith. And that lack of faith will inform Jesus as he speaks to his disciples, as he sends them out. Basically, he says, God's word is for everybody. Everyone deserves a chance to hear the word of God. But if people are going to have a lack of faith, if they're going to ridicule you, if they're going to reject you, just walk away. You do not have to stay in places where people are actively rejecting you and pushing you out. 
You do not have to stay in the places where people are saying, look, there is no way I'm going to listen to you. I don't care what you have to say. Get out. Be gone. I'm done. Jesus says, okay. If there are people who want to reject the word of God, let them. God's word is for everyone. God's word should be preached everywhere. Everyone should know of the power and the love and the mercy of the living God. But if there are people who do not want to, who do not want to know, just walk away. Let them be. But when you do it, shake the dust off your feet. Don't walk away quietly. Leave an impression. And I love this idea of rejection. That Jesus is telling his disciples, look, go forward. Don't take anything with you except a staff, your sandals, and a single tunic. He's saying, set yourself apart from the other wandering preachers in this era. The other wandering preachers, they would have at least two tunics, and they would have a bag wrapped around their waist in order to collect alms. So they would be going around and preaching in order to get money, and they would have a bag on their waist, a money bag, to collect alms. And Jesus says, that's not what we're about. We're about radical hospitality, the radical message of God's love, and the radical welcome. So he says, when when you go into a village, find a house. Let them welcome you in. Accept hospitality where hospitality is given. And then when the hospitality runs out, leave and shake the dust off your feet. And I love that. Jesus is saying, don't take rejection passively. Name it. Name it. It's okay that you don't want to listen to me, but I shake the dust off my feet and I'm walking away. I'm walking to somewhere new, somewhere that will welcome me, somewhere that will embrace this message. And Jesus is telling his disciples, trust in the goodness of others until they show you that they don't have goodness to give. And Jesus is being formed by this rejection that he's experiencing. He's a dishonored prophet. His message is too radical for many people to hear. This idea that we should not hold up the powers of this world, but that God's kingdom is born in the least and the lowly. That the rich will go away empty, but that the hungry will be fed. This is the message that Jesus is preaching, and this is the message that gets him rejected and dishonored. And this is the message that we are also called to preach and teach. That the kingdom of God is for the outcasts first and foremost. That the kingdom of God is made up of those who have been rejected, who have been forced to shake the dust off their feet and try again and start again. The kingdom of God is built up of all of those who have been dishonored in their own hometowns, among their own kin, in their own house, who have been rejected and told, you are not welcome here. You are not like us. You are not worthy. Jesus says, that, those are the people that God is calling to build up the kingdom. So the disciples went out and proclaimed that all should repent. 
And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and they cured them. And the disciples cared for those around them and shook off the dust on their feet when they weren't welcome. And that is what we are called to do. To give the radical welcome. to embrace those who have felt rejection and felt hurt and felt betrayed by their own family and friends. We are called to say, this is your place. This is your place. You're welcome here. We've been outcasts too. Jesus was an outcast too. So shake off the dust, shake off the bad memories of every time that someone has rejected you, has said that you're not good enough, has said that you're weird or crazy. Shake it off and come start again here in God's family, here in God's kingdom, here in God's house. Amen. Friends, would you stand in body or in spirit as we sing from Sing the Faith? It's number 2126. There's a slight, but 2126, All Who Hunger. Let us pray. Most holy God, we lift up our prayers to you. O oh Lord, hear us as we shout our praise and our thanksgiving. Hear us as we cry out our sorrows and our hurts, our worries and our fears. We pray for all of those who have felt keenly 
rejection, who have been hurt by those who were called to love them. We pray, O Lord, that this might be a place of healing and hope. We pray, O Lord, that we might show love and compassion, that your kingdom might grow, that we might come together, a bunch of outcasts who have been rejected, who have been dishonored, but who love, who love you and love one another. Lord, may every need be met, needs for food and water, needs for shelter, needs for a listening ear, for healing in body, mind, or spirit, for someone to just show some compassion. Oh Lord, may you be the God who meets needs. And our God, we pray on this occasion, on this Independence Day, remembering in particular our country. We give you thanks for the good dreaming that envisioned a land of freedom and opportunity, a land in which to grow respect for all citizens. We give you thanks for all who sacrificed in so many ways to create and to sustain such dreaming. We give you thanks for the many ways in which that dream has been and continues to be embraced and made manifest as a better tomorrow is shaped for all, all within these borders and beyond them. We thank you for the call to let freedom shine, to let celebration of the dignity of all resound. But we also confess to you that many ways in which we fall short of our best dreaming fall into immaturity and selfishness, into short-sightedness and rejection into too much of a focus on immediate benefits for some and a lesser tomorrow for all. We confess to binding the dream we apparently sometimes want to claim in word only, not in words made flesh. Reinstill in us the dream, the dreaming God. Guide us into the disciplines of love and grace that cultivate those ideals of discipline and sacrifice of a commitment to our children and our children's children, that theirs should be a better land than ours is now, with more mature leaders and citizens than we are, with greater opportunities than we have known, with even deeper respect for all citizens, a more far-reaching vision, with richer examples of freedom and bravery, because that's the way we dream it to be. We lift up all of our prayers in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the table of Christ. This is not my table. This is not First Presbyterian's table. This is God's table. And God welcomes all here. There is room for everyone. For those who have been here many, many times, for those who have never been before, for those who are sure in their faith, for those who are more doubt and questions than anything else. This is God's table, and all are welcome here. Let us pray. Imaginative God, it was you who who whispered, and the rumble of creation shook the rafters of chaos. Mighty trees graced valleys with shade. Stars glittered in moonless nights. Children splashed in the pools of hope. Every delight was crafted so we might know of that love which would last forever. When we could not have our way, we took offense at your hopes for us, throwing tantrums as we took flight to follow sin and death through the world. Amazed at our crafty rebellion, you continued to love us, 
longing to shelter us in your heart. When we continued to dishonor your prophets, when we would not welcome their words, you sent Jesus to become that weakness strong enough to destroy sin and death. Holy are you, God of all goodness and truth, and blessed is Jesus, your child, our Savior. It was he who came, bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, with words which could transform our foolishness, with weakness which could strengthen our fatigued faithfulness, with wisdom which could teach us the way of life in all its fullness. Yet we were offended by his life, his ways, his humility. He continued to listen to you, going wherever you sent him, no glory, no wealth, no honor, even to that place called Calvary, where this was enough for him, even in the cold shadows of the tomb. And he walked forth into your steadfast love, leaving death behind in the dust. As we remember his calling us to follow, as we seek to be sent forth to serve, we proclaim that mystery that we call faith. Christ came to shape our lives like his, Christ came to be our guide forever. Christ will come again to gather us in glory. So now in this place where we have heard your promises among these people in whom we have seen the Christ, pour your spirit upon the gifts of your table. The broken bread of life is all we need of hope. For fulfilled, we can go forth to anoint the lost and hopeless with the oil of compassion. Your cup of grace overflows more than we will ever need and more than enough to bring healing to those who have only known hardship, rejection, and loneliness. And when at the end of all time we discover that it was you who had led us along the way and brought us to the table in glory, we will join our voices as one, singing our praise to you, God and community, holy and one. Amen. Friends, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus sat with his disciples and taking bread, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and giving thanks to God, he said, this cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. As often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again in glory. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, the bottom is the bread. This is the bread of life. Eat and remember. And drink now the cup of salvation and remember Christ's love. Let us pray. Lord, as you have strengthened us and fed us at this table, may we go out with love and grace to feed our neighbors, to show your compassion and your peace and your welcome to all. Amen. The closing hymn today is an insert, because, and because I am the one who gets to pick the hymns, I chose my personal favorite today. I love to tell the story. So would you please join in body or in spirit, stand and sing with me. Jesus said. 
now, and wherever a people will hear you, proclaim the life-changing love of God. Do not fear your weakness, for when you are weakest, Christ's strength is known. Travel lightly, live simply, and honor those who welcome the gospel. And may God be your protection and safe haven. May the power of Christ Jesus dwell in you, and may the Holy Spirit be your guide forever. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.